What I want to do today is to introduce to you this workshop that we ran with those senators, the exact same thing, which is built for any individual to think about what are we doing, to notice why it's a big deal, why it actually helps all the things that we've been doing, and then what more we're going to do in order to stabilize the climate in the long term. You guys ready to play with me? All right. Here we go. I'm going to pass out um, these sheets. Could you take half of those and then pass them along and pass them back? And we'll pass the other ones over here. Just pass them around. You don't need to look at them too closely yet. You'll need them later. Um, so the workshop is built around this simulator. You've seen earlier versions. Remember one that was all about countries? This is one about solutions. This is a solution simulator called En-ROADS. It's been externally validated. We go through this whole process using this method called system dynamics modeling. We compare it to past history. We compare it to big other models. We show it to other scientists and say, hey, other scientists, tell us if you think this model is appropriate for its purpose. So it's solid that way. And here's the story that it tells. You can see over here, over here is the energy mix. See that red line? This is oil out to 2100. How much oil we will use if we don't take any action. Guess what this brown line is? What do you think that is? Coal. There's a lot of coal on Earth. And even with it getting more expensive relative to the other sources, if you think about it globally, there are plans to develop a lot of coal around the world. That's why it's growing and growing and growing. Same with natural gas. Fracking and other approaches have led us to find more and more natural gas in blue. This is bioenergy. Here are wind and solar, which have been growing. That's growing, but it's still a small fraction of total energy supply, but growing over time. Here is good old uranium-based nuclear, and down here at zero is a new technology that we haven't imagined yet, but Bill Gates and others are saying maybe we'll have thorium fission, maybe we'll have nuclear fusion, maybe we'll imagine coming out of MIT some new technology, so we can imagine that could happen. Put all this together with the improvements in energy efficiency, population growing up to about 11 billion, GDP per capita growing pretty strongly as much of the developing world gets air conditioners and cars and bigger houses, et cetera. Put all that together, emissions of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, methane and nitrous oxide and F gases, put it together and we have temperature around 4.2 degrees, which is a world we could not adapt to. What we want to is get this down to, what are the goals? Where would we really like temperature to be out the second half of the century? Two is the goal that all the countries of the world have agreed to with an effort to get all the way down to 1.5 degrees. Here's two, this dotted line, here's 1.5 degrees. And the way this is going to work is we're going to make suggestions down here, ideas in the bottom. And what you'll see is that uh, the model moves very quickly. So the trick here is that we took 38,000 equations and packed it into a internet browser in a way that makes it run really, really fast. These models used to run over a couple weeks because they were really big. We've made a simple, small model for you and for decision makers. So what we're going to do is think, as an alternative to this world, what could we make happen? The first big question is, what have all of you been doing? What are the efforts that have been the most successful over this last 10 years? And I know I have an opinion because I've been watching and appreciating all that Sierra Club has been doing, but think for yourselves. What have been the biggest wins in Western North Carolina that you think make a difference to the climate? And don't say it yet, but think. Um, the areas where you could talk about it are about coal, oil, gas, renewable energy, nuclear, a new technology, carbon pricing, energy efficiency in vehicles, electrification of vehicles, ele energy efficiency in buildings or electrification there, changing population or economic growth, less deforestation, less methane, eating vegetarian and landfills and other things that are other gases, carbon removal by growing trees or by 
removing it in other technological methods. So all what I just said is on the piece of paper you have. So look at it, turn to the person next to you and say, I think we did a great job when we succeeded with X. That probably helped the climate the most of anything that we've been doing. And then the second most of anything that we've done over this last five or 10 years. Or really what you're up to right now that you think makes a big difference. So what are you doing what, that's making a difference? And if you're not in the Sierra Club and you're here for this, just talk about what you've been doing in your own life. Um, you know, we should, I, that's right, I had a sharing plan. We don't need one per person, so three of you, pass those back to the people, yeah. This is two, I only got, yeah, one for every two people. So pass them back. Raise your hand. People in the back didn't get them, did you? Yeah, so pass more back. Share some. So look at it. Turn to the person next to you. The biggest success I've seen in my life, in Sierra Club, in my community, wherever I am, uh, has been this. So turn to the person. What have we been doing? Where have we succeeded? Talk to each other. Hey, Ken. Ken. Can you come here? I'm going to ask, this is more assumptions. I'm going to ask people. There are always some nerds that like to see this, and I'll ask and hand them to the people who say they like. I'll do that. I will. And along the way, if that sheet looks overly simplified and you love looking at assumptions and models and you're an, an engineer or a retired engineer and it's driving you crazy, you don't know what's in the model, Ken has assumptions for you, but I know it's not everybody. So raise your hand if you'd love to see more about what the heck is under the hood here. These are the under hood people. Yeah, I knew there are always seven. There you are. Love it. Give this to the under the hood people. But keep going. You're talking to each other. The biggest successes. Okay, let's hear the top three. What have been the biggest wins in Sierra Club, Western North Carolina? Beyond coal. Beyond coal. Energy efficiency and transport. Okay, I'm gonna just take those three. Beyond coal. As a fan, I have to say beyond coal because we, we shut down that coal-fired power plant. Yeah. Remind me, what year was that? Three years ago. A, to shut down a coal-fired power plant on this planet is a big deal. So just, first of all, give yourself a hand for pulling that off. Seriously, that is huge. And you're going to see in a minute why. So the first experiment I'd like to give is, what if everybody in the world did the same thing? In Romania, and Uruguay, and Thailand, and China, and China's doing a lot of it, actually. They're doing a lot of shutting down coal-fired power plants. But... Um, mostly because of the air quality concerns, not the climate concerns. They're poisoning their citizens, their citizens are getting unhappy, they're shutting down a lot of coal. What if everybody did that? Now imagine the impact it would have. Watch that black line. If, and I'm gonna go over here, and you can see in the top left, there's status quo. Watch the brown line on the top left. As I move it, and we tax it a little, and we tax it a bit, and we tax it a good bit. You see the brown line come down? So really high, and then boom, and then it comes down, and then temperature does what? A little bit, you said a little bit. 0.4 degrees is not a little bit. 0.4 degrees, and we're trying to get to two, as you'll see, relative to some other things that can happen, is actually a lot. It keeps a lot of coal, oil, and gas safely in the ground. Now, if we're able to really succeed with this around the world, and there's this advanced feature you can see, we're going underneath the hood a bit, and accelerate retirement. That's what you actually did. Didn't just put pressure on coal, but actually shut them down. Watch the, the brown line. 
then it's going all the way down to 3.6 degrees. So that right there is 0.6 degrees, which is a large amount of future temperature that has been avoided. So that's a big deal. The second thing that you all have been doing, I heard, was energy efficiency. And when you, who said energy efficiency? All of you. So throw out like energy efficiency. So what, like what? In light bulbs, LED light bulbs, uh huh. In transportation. Two carpool, exactly, yep. Buildings and in industry probably around here. So there are two ways to think about that. There's buildings and industry, and watch what it does. We've already done a lot with coal, but watch natural gas. If we get much more efficient over this next 80 years, then what we can do is turn down that blue line of natural gas and also in transport, and this is carpooling, public transport. This is also more Priuses, fewer SUVs. Watch as I turn down. Which line moved the most there as I hit energy efficiency and transport? Oil, that red line of oil, and it's difficult to turn the oil line, but look at it come down all the way to 3.1 degree. So we have coal peaking here, 2021. Oil persistent through the century, it's difficult to turn that down, but more efficient use helps a lot. And then here's natural gas right now, which is growing pretty steadily over time. So those, two, those three actions together, and mind you, there are a lot of other sources of greenhouse gases, but just with those three, coal and energy efficiency in transport and also in buildings and in industry, it brings the future from the untenable 4.2 to the equally not attractive, but much better 3.1. Now one note, this happens to be identical to what we think national plans to the Paris Agreement and the proposals to the Paris Agreement would bring us. So imagine if all the countries, China peaked emissions in 2030, if somehow the United States followed through on its commitment to reduce 26 to 28% below 2005 by 2025, and on and on and on, all the 195 countries who made pledges to the Paris Agreement would get us about here. This also shows us that we can't count on an international process because we haven't seen that there's going to be a ratcheting up of these pledges. It's going to require other forces, such as local, such as corporate, such as state, such as national. So here we are, 3.1. There are 18 levers. You've touched three. You happen to have touched three of the most powerful ones. We're going to need to keep on looking. What are other things that are happening in Western North Carolina or in your lives that if everyone else picked up that action and followed suit, it would make a difference? Yes. Eating vegetarian. So meat is incredibly resource intensive, and particularly carbon intensive, particularly beef and teric fermentation. These cows, they, they burp and they fart methane. Methane's nasty stuff to the climate. So over here, and it does a couple things. First, if we could reduce methane, here we go. People are still giggling. You say fart and it's just, you know someone's gonna giggle. <laughs> someone's over here, all right, so watch. Just actions on these other gases. These other gases outside of carbon dioxide are 30% of greenhouse gases. So when we have less of it, and it's not just less cows, it's also less digest, more digesting of their manure, but also if we have fewer cows, then we believe that we can actually have a little less deforestation and also perhaps more chances to grow more trees. Trees pull carbon out of the atmosphere through photosynthesis, go trees, and therefore reduce temperature. We've gotten all the way down from 3.1 to 2.7. Now there's a video out there and there are people who are gonna tell you half the solution is eating vegetarian. That's not true. We're in a funny world right now where anybody who has got an idea that they love wants it to be the answer, as if you have to have it be the answer for it to be a good idea. It's like, there's, it's like there, people think they're running an election, like who's gonna be the winner? Which of Drew's 18 levers is the answer? There's no silver bullet. There's no silver bullet. There's no one thing. We've already moved 
many, and we haven't even gotten there, there's no silver bullet. It's more like silver buckshot, perhaps, of many actions that are going to spread out on many domains on every level of our global economy to get us where we need to go. What's helpful about that is you don't have to choose the right thing and hope that you pick the right candidate to pass leaflets about or something. Instead, just be confident it's making a contribution, if it is. There's some things that actually don't help very much. But many of the things that we're doing do add up to really help. And when somebody exaggerates and says, it's a cowspiracy, 51% of the solution is from e eating vegetarian, you know, just acknowledge it's part of the answer and everyone just settle down about the silver bullets. Okay, so 2.7 we've gotten by doing those actions. What are other things that you all have been doing? Yes. We should take ethanol out of the gas so that less biofuels, bioenergy, and say why we should take... Interesting. So what the gentleman is saying is that we should take ethanol out because it's not efficient. And our analysis has actually shown he's right. Burning trees, processing plants, and particularly the burning of trees. What's happening in the southeast, as you see, they're chipping our forests, sending it to England, and then burning it in coal-fired power plants, calling it zero carbon energy. Calling it zero carbon energy, really. So if you look at the trends for energy use, excuse me, for carbon emissions from the UK go down because of this accounting fix. It's really not good and Dogwood Alliance is doing a lot about it, which is great. The way we would test it here, and it, it's funny, so here's bioenergy, so say we have uh, less bioenergy, and it, it's actually, so it doesn't even move us from 2.7. Most, many people think, oh, if we have less bioenergy, temperature would go up. It isn't, it's about a wash. You get less bioenergy, you get a little bit more natural gas, and it's basically a wash. So you're right. Keep the forests as forests, and not just because of climate, but because of biodiversity and all sorts of other reasons. So any other actions that, and this is only what we should do. I'm really asking right now, what have we done? We're going to talk next about what we should do. Plastics. Say it again. Plastics. plastics. Plastics and consumption. And really, one way to look at plastics, what is plastic made from? Oil. Any pressure, any pressure on oil, watch the red line that tips that down, 2.6. So I just want to acknowledge the kinds of things that you've been spending your energy on if the world, we were finding a way that the world would follow suit. Now, mind you, we're following the world in many ways. <laughs> we're not the best at this. But if the world followed the actions that you're taking, we would not have a world heading toward 4.2 degrees, but instead, here to 2.6. It's a lot. It is a huge contribution. What more do we need to do? Now, pause a second before you raise your hand, unless you have a question about how we are so far. No. Okay. So, here we are. We have taxed coal and shut it down in many places. Put a little pressure on oil, on bioenergy, radically increased energy efficiency to the point where Amory Lovins of Rocky Mountain Institute would be overjoyed. Reduced deforestation, grown more, grown more trees, and reduced somewhat methane and other gases. Look at your piece of paper and think, what else do we need to be doing in the world to get where we really want to go? Well, hold on, hold on. Look at your piece of paper. Talk to the person next to you. Think. Think a little bit. I'll show you. It's a good question. Okay, you've had a minute to talk to each other. I've got a, had a very good question about the model and, and really what's going on underneath. And the question was, am, are we assuming a decrease in demand for energy? And um, overall, before I, we did any levers, 
The short answer is yes. The overall, well, excuse me, there's an increase in the overall energy efficiency of use. So imagine more people, more GDP, more consumption, more efficient use of energy per unit of, of money that's being generated. And then we add on top these other actions. So, well, we just did like energy efficiency. So watch what happens. I'm gonna um, pull up another graph. And by the way, when this is released on July 15th, you, anyone who likes these kind of models should go and run this for their friends and schools and all that. The model will be free and open source and on the web. And when you do that, go and look at all the other graphs. So here's a graph of total final energy consumption. The black line is what we assumed in the base case. More people, more consumption, more GDP, but more efficient use on net means more energy use on Earth. It's growing and growing and leveling. With this scenario, though, that we've already created, we're assuming it goes down. Why is it going down? Because of efficiency. So watch, we are getting much more efficient. So if we didn't do that in transport, if we didn't have more Priuses and less SUVs, and if we didn't have better light bulbs and more insulation, it would have still gone up more, but instead, boom. The other thing that sent it down, if we were to tax coal, energy gets a little more expensive. If energy is more expensive, what happens? Less energy use, right? It, it just drives, it drives the um, consumption. It's a great way to drive energy efficiency if it's expensive. So that's the answer to your question. And going back, we're gonna go back to default graph. So here's where we were. We were at 2.7, I asked you, what else do we need to do? What are the actions that we need to take to close that gap? And uh, so someone raise your hand. Yeah, yes ma'am. Birth control. As you know, this is a very controversial and very difficult topic for this whole field. I've been working in sustainability for 30 years and there was a time when a lot of very earnest environmental sustainability people really cross some lines of going around the world saying that we need less of you people and perhaps implicitly more of us people. So it's a pretty challenging thing to, to talk about as a leverage point. And we can say there are various futures for population. Here's where we are right now, headed the middle UN projection towards 11 billion. If things change and we take a very different scenario, is it a silver bullet? Will it bring us to two degrees? If it's lower, like that, like headed at 10 billion, then it would lead to less energy consumption, less carbon emissions, and a slightly uh, more cool world. So um, it matters, and it is driving change, and yet it isn't the silver bullet that some people um, may imagine it to be. So thank you. Here we are at 2.6. <coughs> yes, sir. More renewables. It's interesting. <coughs> Here's the green line. We've gotten pretty far by going after the fossil fuels. And it is a particularly effective way to address things, keeping coal, oil, and gas in the ground. That said, <coughs> excuse me, watch what happens to the blue line. And really, the, green, the blue line of natural gas is a big challenge right now. If we are able to boost renewables by subsidizing them, watch the green line go up and watch that blue line of natural gas. In the post-2050s, we won't need as much natural gas if we have wind and solar and it is able to boom the way that it likely will. Excuse me one second. A dear friend has just helped me with, uh, you can tell I'm losing my voice. So there's the green line of renewables growing and growing and growing, and it finally tipped down the fossil fuel that was growing throughout the century, natural gas. We have a long-term energy supply that is zero carbon, and that has gotten us down to 2.4. Can you taste it, huh? 2.4, we're getting a little closer. Mike, nuclear. So what do you like about nuclear? At the moment, it's expensive and dangerous. Yep. <clears throat> oh, 
Okay, so the, the suggestion is, and I know this could be a whole session, right? I've, I've heard just to my left and right the murmurings of like, oh, this is a little bit controversial in the Sierra Club, I imagine. In the context of here, I'd like to explore why it's suggested and what it might do and what its role might be in this scenario. Because we usually think of it as like there's all these solutions, but I want you to look at where we are now and think what could nuclear do? What we have right now is a very inexpensive zero carbon energy supply in renewables that's growing here. In fact, it grew so much that nuclear peaked in 2030 and then is going down. So we have a zero carbon energy supply. We would like to somehow have less oil and less gas. But if we were to just, on top of all this, encourage nuclear, um, well, imagine, what do you think it's going to do? It's difficult to, uh, it, these renewables are so successful and dominant around the world that it really is hard to make it grow. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go under here, and I'm going to imagine a world where suddenly they, we have like a 50% cost reduction. So if they got really cheap, then nuclear wins. And so there's this, the blue line is nuclear. And so we don't have wind and solar. We have nuclear as an alternative. But it really is, it's just a question of what do you want your long-term supply to be? It could be this, it could be this. If not those two, of course, there's also the idea that some people think it's going to be something we haven't even invented yet, which is thorium fission or fusion. So there's really just a question, and the technologies are being sorted out. Is it going to be wind, solar, a new technology? Is it going to be uranium fission? And um, we're figuring it all out. But, but it, wouldn't, it doesn't need to be a fight between all of them. And in the scenario we already had, we seem to be doing pretty well with this, new, this energy future with uh, wind and solar. So there it was, 2.4. Yes. No, um, so with the two of them, still those, we, there's a lot of oil and gas in the world. And imagine in Russia and in, uh, India, you know, and they have access to it and darn it, they're going to sell it um, unless, unless there's an action to say, let's keep it in the ground. Now, mind you, there's an action that hasn't been discussed yet, which is doing that, which is said, let's make coal, oil, and gas really expensive. What am I hinting at here? Washington State didn't pass. What's that? Carbon. Carbon price. So that is the kind of action that presumably will start tipping down this red line and the blue line of gas and oil. And so that's what we over here. Now, it, one of the beautiful things about carbon price is it does so much to coal. You've already done that. You have made this global Beyond Coal campaign that was so successful. But on top of that, yeah. So carbon price. Any of you guys, you guys work with Citizen Climate Lobby, they're working pretty hard about a carbon fee and dividend here in the United States. Th did you notice it just closed the gap? So boom. And what did I set that as? A pretty high carbon price. I set it up to uh, $100 a ton or something, like a pretty significant carbon price, $100 a ton. So that gets us to 2.1. Um, we're close. I want you to get a feel that rush that you actually succeeded in just taking it over the line. 2.1. What else is it going to take? White roofs, white, shingles. white roofs and white shingles. Nice. So, yeah, so, so the, the idea is white roofs, white shingles. Why? Increase the albedo of Earth. This is why your white car doesn't heat up as much as your black car. It's, it's not a little oven. So uh, if there's more light bouncing off of Earth on white roofs, then it actually will heat up a little less. I didn't model that. Darn it. Uh, that, that could help. What else? Yes. Plant more trees. So here we had, because of the cattle, a little bit more afforestation planting trees. But what if we have even more? And what if we're able to find more land out there for planting trees and boost it up um, it takes a lot of land, and frankly, 
doesn't bring temperature down as much as things that keep coal oil and gas in the ground. So uh, it helped, but not enough to move that number. Yes? So inject CO2 into the earth. This is called carbon capture and sequestration, carbon capture and storage. And it's one of the big ideas that's out there to supplement all these other things that we've mentioned. You know, think of it as, uh, you know, s there's so many things to keep us from in putting more carbon in the atmosphere. These are the things that might pull it out. These are called we're calling them technological carbon removal. There are many types that people are imagining. Um, I'm gonna pull up, there are a good number. And so there's bioenergy carbon capture and storage that some people are imagining, um, which is growing trees and then burning them or capturing the carbon, putting that in the ground. Direct air capture, which is what this is most like, capture the carbon, shove it in the ground. And overall, there are, uh, you can trap it in soil, biochar, mineralization. What I'll do is I will bump it up some, and there you got two degrees. Give yourself a hand. So there are ideas about algae. Pull the carbon out. They die. They go to the bottom with all the carbon. Boost it up a little bit more. 1.9. We're well below. Two, we're below two degrees. Okay, so I want us to pause. Last question. Or, sir, you've been really patient in the back there. Yeah, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And there was a hand. Yeah. The, the idea is about some of these new technologies that could ca pull carbon out of the atmosphere and actually maybe use it for something important in the world. Not just carbon capture and storage, but carbon capture and utilization. So the price that he mentioned that it is about $100 a ton, note that that is very, very expensive at this point and could make a contribution. But it's really important, these ideas about carbon capture and storage may contribute in the long term, but I see as a much lower priority than keeping it in the ground in the first place. So if your basement is flooding and you go down there, your priority is to turn off the faucets. You're not immediately thinking about mops and buckets and going, particularly if the mops and buckets don't exist. That's what we've got going on here. The turning off the faucet is keeping the coal, oil, and gas safely underground so that you don't emit it and burn it and then have to go capture it and process it and try to find something to do with it. So this is, a, it's a question of priority. I'm, carbon capture can help, so I'm gonna move this back like if we have none of it and we have a lot of it. So that's a lot right there. Um, I think about eight gigatons or so per year, which is a lot. But it, note that it is 0.2. It is not a huge part of it. The success that you just got and where our energy should be and where the reason I acknowledge the Sierra Club, beyond coal, like keep it in the ground. Don't dig the stuff up and burn it in the first place. It, like that kind of scenario you've created is some of the most high leverage actions. And if ever there's a moment when you can do something that keeps coal, oil, and gas in the ground versus promotes an alternative to it, even renewables and electric cars and things like that, it's highest leverage. 
Things that have us not burn oil, not burn gas, not burn coal. That's one thing I love about Sierra Club is that you focused on that in, in many ways. And then the third point of leverage would be, okay, once it's out there, yeah, we gotta like grab as much as possible and get it back in the ground. But that is very hard to do. Focus on keeping it on the ground in the first place. Yes. Government action. We give so much to other countries. Why not focus on government action that makes so many of these things happen? Well said. Fantastic. Thank you. So I want to just pause here for a second, though. Here's what we've just done. Notice what you just did. We talked about the actions that you all have taken. And imagine if the rest of the world took those actions. Those were actions around keeping coal in the ground promoting energy efficiency and transport in buildings and in industry. You talked about things that you all have done already with less or more plant-based diets and less um, cutting down trees, growing more trees, et cetera. And then imagine things that need to happen around the world. If they did happen around the world, here's what we would see. Coal peaking globally around 2020 and then dropping steadily, gas, and oil peaking, natural gas and oil, in the 2030s and then dropping steadily. And then a growth in wind and solar. I want to slow down and just have us consider this is possible. There's a cloud of resignation floating all the way around the earth that is saying right now, so many people stuck. And I had people coming up to me even before this event just now. I'm so worried, Drew. I worry about this, people said. I don't think we can do it. I need some hope. I need some possibility. And I want to name to you, this is possible. Consider the actions that we all just said could happen. This is a future that is 100% possible. It's not accessible right on the edge of our fingertips right now, but it is possible. I'm gonna give us 60 seconds. We're gonna be totally silent and I want you to think about what you would love about this happening. 60 seconds. So what would you love? What, put it in one or two words. Health benefits. Hold on, hold on one second. Go ahead. Hold on one second, Lou. There would be a much greater chance of me surviving. There would be a Survival after Lou Patry is long gone. <laughs> what else? Just a, some words, yes. Belief that we could take on other big problems, and there are plenty of those. Yes. Survival of non-human species. Survival of non-human species. Yes. Not waking up in the morning and thinking, what else do I have to do? What else would you love about this? Yes, ma'am. It would involve a lot of people working together. And people working with, in harmony. Thank you. Yes, Mary. Less human displacement around the world. There's so much we would love about this. Consider, yeah, go ahead. Fewer deaths due to diseases we have no idea about, such as release from permafrost and things like that. 
This is a possibility. And I, this possibility I want to offer takes hope. And the hope that I'm talking about is not an assessment. It's a choice. It's a choice when you consider all of these things you just mentioned that you would love to see. It's a choice to say, I have hope. I'm going to live my life in a way that's consistent with a possibility of future like this. It's not as clear as, I think we've got it, so I'm hopeful. That's different. Hope is a choice, not an assessment. Hope is a choice, not an assessment. That said, there are some other facts about this. Someone mentioned about health and other benefits. And today, a colleague of mine, Beth Sawin, who is the co-director of Climate Interactive with me, sent me some of these numbers about all the other things that get better, not in 2050 or 2080, but like on Tuesday. I was really struck um, by, and the idea is what we call multi-solving. Multi-solving, changing lives for the better while protecting the climate. Lives for the better, health, jobs, economic health, justice, equity, other creatures, things that we care about that get better immediately. So some of the numbers that I saw were just these studies that have been done about in the United States just due to renewable energy from 2007 to 2015, we've avoided 7,000 premature deaths just because we've had more renewable energy. $56 billion saved from public health benefits. The amount of respiratory disease that we've avoided, for example, asthma, because of coal, because again, of Beyond Coal and Sierra Club. 56 billion, I see a billion, I wanna think that's an M, no it's a B, billion dollars. 32 billion saved in avoided climate costs. Then with jobs, some calculations were done. If $200 billion were invested in energy efficiency and clean energy, 4.2 million jobs would be created. This is a job creator in this country at a time when we really would love for that to happen. Urban tree planting and system benefits. Some of the numbers here. A 2005 study of urban tree planting found that the value of planting trees ranged from $31 to $89 per dollar spent on the planting the trees. That's with stormwater, flood risk reduce, energy saved, pollution reduced, mental health, physical health, plant some more trees in cities. Again, these are benefits in the near term here and now, not just in the long term. There was a 2005 study in New York City about walkability and health. They built new sidewalks, bike lanes, and improved safety at crossing, so it was easier for kids to walk to school. And there was a 33 to 44% reduction in school age injury rates, 14% reduction in injuries across all ages, and $230 million saved from health costs just from doing these things. Benefits here and now. Tree planting, Fort Collins, they planted a lot of trees and they found hundreds of thousands of dollars in energy savings. Overall, if we frame this issue as a systems challenge and we think of all the benefits to many groups of people and ensure that when we design the policies, we get those benefits, there's a huge potential to make a lot of these good things really happen. So overall, what I want to do is to acknowledge all that you've done already to think what would it take to spread many of these actions all the way around the world in order to get the benefits in the here and now across health and jobs and the economy and overall create a sustainable climate that really will take care of ourselves into the future. Overall, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be worth it. Let's do it. We have some time for test test. We have some time for some questions. That is a bold arm. That is an arm that is straight up, ma'am. You're ready. What's your question? <laughs> I actually oh, this is killing me. Uh, so the question is, what did the senator say? And um, 
I actually can't say. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, we, we're not allowed to talk what happened in the, in the room other than it happened in the room. Um, but stepping back, um, well, we didn't do one test that I thought was kind of interesting. Um, let's just say, and I heard you all mention it before, there's a lot of interest in electric cars and a lot of excitement because we can make a lot of money selling electric cars and they're cool and they're better. Um, and what's your sense? 4.2. Imagine a huge amount of electric cars in the world. 4.2 goes down to 2, 3.1, Real 3.9. Really think about this. Okay, imagine more electric cars in the world, in this world, just electric cars and electric trucks and electric, yeah. So how are you generating, thank you, Bob. How are you generating, however you would if you needed a lot more electricity on Earth today given the regulatory system and the pressure or lack thereof on the fossil fuel industry. So I just turned it up. Did you see it move? What line moved? Coal went up because on Earth today, if we need more electricity, where do we get electricity? Coal. So absent a carbon price, absent greening the grid, they don't help that much. Now they're better, they're more efficient at trans and turning fuel into turning wheels. So it's better to burn fossil fuels in a huge plant, it's really efficient, put it in a wire, than it is to have a tiny little plant in your internal combustion engine in the front of your car. That's really inefficient. So it's somewhat more efficient, but it is a revival to the global coal industry and natural gas. And you know, we get a little boost in renewables. What we really need is a carbon price in electrification. And you're like, oh, okay. So let's get things in the proper order. So one thing that did come up is this, because we'd love to have an industry making electric cars, but absent pressure on coal, oil, and gas, they on themselves, from our analysis, don't help that much. Yes, sir. Absolutely. So one by one, you put the solar panel on your roof and you stop buying coal from other, and buy behind oil as well, absolutely there's a benefit one by one. What we're talking about is when five billion people on earth adopt this, how does the economic system respond to this new technology? And when we model that, not one by one, this is the result we get. Yes, sir. What if we What if these sources of energy uh, had their true costs is the suggestion. What if we actually paid those true costs? And the most efficient way to do that is really what I just offered here, which is a carbon price where they really are playing much closer to their 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 cost and that really changes how we use it. Other other questions just in the back. So do I have a website for the handout? The, this is not released, as I mentioned before. This is going to be released on July 15th. It's going to be a big day. If you would love to run this model, take the whole workshop out into the world. We do have other games, called, one called World Climate. has been played in 85 countries. And there is a website that has all of our stuff except for those pieces of paper which you get to hang on to. That's the only versions that are out there. It's called Climate interactive. So we are called Climate Interactive and everything is there uh, if you want to run the games that are, are publicly available. Yes, sir. Hold on, let me just make sure everyone heard that. So one thing that's giving him hope is all the young people taking action. There were these school strikes a couple weeks ago. I was at a rally at Pritchard Park for those students who didn't go to school, particularly in Europe. What's the second thing you were gonna say, sir? In th 
So the drawdown book said that one of the big uh, leverage points is refrigerants. And that is one of these actions. Remember when we moved methane and other gases? So HFCs and other gases are over here. And they do move temperature, like right there. Look at that. I told you 0.2 is a big degree, big reduction. That kind of action reduces refrigerants, absolutely. Last two over here. Yes, sir. Yeah, well said. Talk to the b billionaires and other people who can make big investments in these things. Yes. Is the Canada question a quiz? Like, you tell me. Like, what, what's going on with the cost of carbon? So the question is, what's happening in Canada with the cost of carbon this week? They're, they're starting a carbon price, pricing program. And the pump storage, I hadn't heard of, but there's so many technologies. But there's one last question I want to ask you all. I know you're starting to pack up. Last five minutes. So where we've been, this journey together, I've told you that the conversation is back. I've acknowledged the things that you've done and seen how far we could get if these actions are taken. And we've talked about what else needs to be done. Along the way, a thought crossed your mind. I could be doing this, having this role in here in the context of Sierra Club in Western North Carolina, in your life, in your social media world, with your family, in your business, whatever it is. For two minutes, turn to the person next to you and say, I feel called to take this action in my life over the next two weeks. So the sentence is, I feel called to do this. Turn to the person next to you. Plant a tree. Hug somebody. What is it? I feel called to do this. So there have been many questions. People have said, where can I get this information? If you go to climateinteractive.org and you search for this model, there will be a place you can sign up and you'll give us your email or come up and give me your email now. And on July 15th, you're going to get a picture of Bill Nye with his scenario. And then you can go and use this all around the world. So go get them. Do a great job. And um, it's so good to be together with you on this.